This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Well, in Chicago, a group of public school parents, grandmothers and education activists are entering the 19th day of a hunger strike to save Diet High School, the only remaining open enrollment public uh, high school left in the community of Bronzeville. Supporters say the city neglected the school for years before announcing plans to close it. Under Mayor Rahm Emanuel, uh, and who is the former chief of staff of, of President Obama, the city has closed about 50 schools in predominantly African American and Latino neighborhoods as part of what critics say is a push to privatize education. The hunger strikers have called for Chicago to reopen Diet High School as a global leadership and green technology school. On Wednesday, Mayor Emanuel was, was to meet with the Diet supporters after a city budget town hall meeting, but his security detail escorted him out when protesters took to the stage and confronted him. Well, in a new development Thursday afternoon, Janice Jackson, chief of education for Chicago Public Schools, announced that Diet High School will reopen as an open enrollment arts-themed high school. But the announcement was seen by some as an attempt to end the hunger strike. But protesters have rejected the proposal, saying, quote, this doesn't reflect the vision of the community. Well, for more, we go to one of the hunger strikers. G2 Brown is joining us from Chicago, the national director of the Journey for Justice Alliance, a member of the Coalition to Revitalize Diet, one of the lead organizers of the hunger strike. G2, welcome back to Democracy Now! Talk about what's at issue, the significance of diet, of Bronzeville, and Chicago history. Yes, and, and thank you, Amy and Juan, for, for having me back. Um, the significance of Bronzeville is that, in the 20th century, it was one of the main destinations for African Americans as we evacuated the South. Um, Bronzeville is the home of Richard Wright, Ida B. Wells, uh, former Chicago Mayor Harold Washington, uh, Nat King Cole, Red Fox, Louis Armstrong, the list goes on and on, Minnie Ripperton, Sam Cooke, uh, Dr. Daniel Hale Williams. Uh, so it's a proud community uh, that has suffered from decades of disinvestment. Um, and Diet High School is the poster child for public school sabotage. I've served on Diet's local school council since 2003. In 2008, we had the largest increase of students going to college in all of Chicago public schools. For two straight years, we had the largest decrease in arrests and suspensions. Uh, we had a nationally recognized restorative justice program. In 2011, we won the ESPN Rise Up Award as a small school that was doing great things and needed a little help. We beat out 400 other schools around the country. And the next year, they voted to phase it out. Uh, we're very clear that in America today, we don't have failing schools. We've been failed. Uh, and we have to be firm on that, because in that process, our children are demonized, shuffled around from school to school, and people actually make money off what should be a human right. Um, this hunger strike came about because we had we were left with no other alternative. Uh, since 2009, the Coalition to Revitalize Diet has attempted to engage Chicago public schools on a K-12 through vision for education in our neighborhood, uh, in absence of one provided by the district. Uh, we have met with literally thousands of Bronzeville residents. We've held six town hall meetings, gotten over 3,000 petition signatures. Uh, over uh, 578 m people in Bronzeville mailed letters to Mayor Rahm Emanuel saying that we want Diet Global Leadership and Green Technology High School as the hub for what we call a sustainable community school village. Uh, and that means that we want feeder schools vertically aligned with Diet Global Leadership and Green Technology High School. We want the, 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 the curriculum to be vertically aligned. We want uh, parents and local school council members to train together. We want to create a network of schools so that we have not only relevance and we have rigor, but we have relationships. Um, this is a visionary plan. Uh, the president of the American Education and Re Research Association, Jeannie Oates, said it was a, a wonderful plan. The president of the American Federation of Teachers, Randy Weingarten, said it was the best academic plan she's seen in 30 years of teaching. But 
Chicago Public Schools, instead of working with the community, created an RFP process uh, after we gave them the proposal in April and violated their own process by uh, changing the date of a hearing. And that's what prompted the hunger strike. It was the latest in just a round of deception, lies, misdirection, ignoring parents, ignoring community input, uh, locking us out of meetings. Uh, and so uh, we, we're on this hunger strike because we've been rendered voiceless. Uh, we, we pay taxes, but our voices don't matter, while uh, the voices of black parents don't matter, black students don't matter, while the voices of parents in Lincoln Park are honored. An example would be um, when parents in Rogers Park said they did not want intrinsic and Noble Street Charter School, they didn't have to get arrested, they didn't have to protest, they went to two meetings, and in two weeks that deal was off the table. Parents in Bronzeville, uh, black parents in Bronzeville create a visionary plan for schools, uh, and we're railroaded at every turn. And yesterday was another example of that. And G2, and G2 Brown, the, uh, the issue of the, the, these massive closings of schools in the, in the black and brown communities of Chicago, and what, what excuse do they give for a school like you, uh, like yours, uh, to be closed? Uh, and, uh, and what were the proposals that they were entertaining <clears throat> to replace it with? So I, I appreciate that, Juan. The, the, the uh, reason, the rationale that they give is either the school is underperforming or is underenrolled. But what we don't realize is that CPS actually makes the schools underperform and set up the situation where schools are underenrolled. So in 1995, when Paul Vallis was the CEO of Chicago Public Schools, they initiated something called school probation, which said if your, if you, your students didn't have a certain test score, there were punitive uh, uh, interventions that the district would make. Uh, schools that go on probation, for most cases, never come off. Uh, it's a graveyard. So what, what happens when your schools go on probation? The curriculum gets narrowed. So from instead of 9 to 9.50, you have reading, uh, and then from 10 o'clock to 10.50, you have uh, creative writing or social studies. Now from 9 to 11.30, you have reading block, test prep. So the, the curriculum gets narrowed. The opportunities for inspiration diminish because students now don't have the options in the curriculum that can capture their imagination. And so the schools don't perform. And so then what happens? We say, well, the solution to this is we're going to close this underperforming school, and then we're going to bring in a private operator who cares less about our input than the district does. Now, at the same time, while children are going through that at a school like Mollison, where the, on the Chicago South Side, where the school is so crowded that students have to eat, uh, get their special ed services under the stairs on the first floor, where students are eating lunch on the floor outside of their classrooms because the school is so crowded, where there's no librarian. At the same time, you have a school like Agassiz in Lincoln Park, a neighborhood school that serves white middle-class residents where the students have Mandarin, Chinese, Arabic, and Spanish, where every teacher has a teacher aid, where you have a fully stocked library. That's not bad teachers. That's not bad students. That's uh, separate and unequal education. So closing schools has been a way to, one, accelerate the movement of African-American and Latino families out of communities, but then also to line the pockets of people that are politically connected. And that's the same thing that's happening in the case of Diet High School. G2 Brown, on day 10 of the hunger strike, paramedics had to be called to check on you as you and the other strikers sat outside of Diet High School. What yes, happened and how are you feeling today? Um, yeah, what, what happened was just that um, the press conference, I got, I got a little, to be honest, I got a little emotional during the press conference and I expended, I think, a little too much energy. Uh, and I hadn't really hydrated like I needed to. So I sat down, and when I jumped up, I, I was a little lightheaded. That, that's all. So they checked my, my blood pressure. Uh, they they uh, checked my blood glucose and said that everything was fine. And they just, they just made me drink a lot of water, which I've been doing every day. Uh, yeah, but that so was day 10. Day. Uh, you're yeah. now all moving in on day 20. It's a 19th day. How yes, long are you planning to hunger strike? How many of you are there? We uh, people are calling the group the Diet 12. They're 12 hunger strikers. Uh, after the mayor's decision to basically uh, open it up, and let me say, we're clear that the school wouldn't be open without us. 
So we have accomplished that. We, we, we're clear on that. But we do not see this as a victory. Uh, this is not a victory for the children in Bronzeville. Um, the people in Bronzeville did not say they wanted an art school. People in Bronzeville said they wanted a global leadership in green technology high school. Uh, that's part of a sustainable community school village, a system of education. So uh, we spoke with, I, I got a call from CPS CEO uh, of Forrest Claypool 15 minutes before the press conference that we were locked out of by CPS. And he told me, I asked him, well, where's the room for negotiation? And he said, well, we're moving forward. So my message to him today is, so are we. We're moving forward. Um, this is a human rights issue. Um, you know, the great poet and author Alice Walker said, no one is your friend who demands your silence or denies your right to grow. Um, this is not uh, something that we take lightly. Uh, these are our children. These are our communities. We have to live with CPS reforms after the people that implement them get promoted to some other job. So we will determine the type of education that our children receive in Bronzeville. Um, we are calling on the U.S. Department of Education, where we have open Title VI civil rights complaints, where they're being investigated right now, to intervene. At the press conference yesterday with the mayor, uh, there were people they locked out the people who fought. So they negotiated the deal with them. Uh, and there were these African-American uh, individuals posing as leaders who stood there and said that they would work on Diet High School. Now, one of the people was also one of the, the, the ministers who led paid protesters into the Diet hearings in 2012 to close the school, where he went in front of the liquor store and the halfway house and got those of us that were most vulnerable, gave them $25 a piece, and told them to—and they held up prefabricated signs saying, you can't support failure, closed diet high school. They got on the microphone and mumbled and, and, and We have and 10 ranted, seconds. Okay, and ranted incoherent statements. And, and so those were not the people that struggled for that school. And those will not be the people that lead Diet's renaissance as Diet Global Leadership at Green Technology High School. G2 Brown, thanks so much for being with us. National Director of the Journey for Justice Alliance. He's in the 19th day of a hunger strike with other hunger strikers around Chicago public schools. That does it for our show.